One and all, welcome in uh, part two of lecture in uh, week two. Now we are going to focus on utility. Utility can be considered as an element of rational decision making. Let's focus on utility theory and start with defining what is utility. The value of a word is the utility that the word has for a specific person. Uh, that's pretty simple. What's more important is that utility is subjective and can vary greatly from one person to another one. What is also possible, based on specific consumption, is that we can create perfect curves uh, and utility functions that basically measure a relative utility, so specific value, of one option against another one. And therefore, based on that, we can determine likelihood that a specific person or people will try to obtain one of the options. In other words, we can say that utility is what is worth to someone. One of the real-life examples is a dating site. This one uh, is pretty popular in the Netherlands. You can see it for yourself. And later on, you can check what basically uh, people value on those portals. What's the utility of specific behaviors, specific options? Say it for yourself. Now let's get back to theory. Utility theory basically assumes that it's pretty helpful if we allocate to describe utility function numbers. Because formally we can use utility functions to obtain those numbers. In more formal language we can say that utility function is a mathematical function which ranks alternatives, so also numbers, according to their utility to an individual, according to their value. So let's consider the simple example, A and B. Uh, those are parts of a choice set. If you would say, based on utility function, that utility of A is higher than utility of B, then that would be possible only if A would be preferred over B. It also means, that's an important assumption, if we would have another choice set, X and Y, and utility of X and utility of Y would be the same, that can happen only if X would be equal to Y. Uh, from a perspective of a individual intuition, we can say that utility function is simply a, a number, a real number in this case, that can be allocated to the most perfect alternative. On the other words, we can also say that if utility for both options is the same, also they represent the same numbers. If we know what rational decision making is and we know what utility is, we can try to combine both aspects. We can say that rational decision is if a person preference are representable by a specific utility function. And then those functions are consistent. It's really important at this point to notice that Cyclical preferences cannot be represented by any utility function, which is a uh, really sweet element of this theory. It's not possible because if A is preferred over B and B is preferred over C, any utility function will automatically imply that A is preferred over C. In other words, if utility of A is 3, utility of B is 2, and utility of C is lower than 2, that directly implies that utility of A is higher than utility of C. Secondly, if a person chooses alternative X from a choice set S, then basically we can say that um, utility of X is the maximum utility 
that can be allocated to choice set S. And this must be true. It means that rational person always maximizes their utility when making a choice. So it means that if you're going to buy a pair of shoes and you have five options to choose from, then rational behavior would be to go for this pair of shoes with which utility is uh, maximum. We can also define important attributes of utility functions. What we can say that utility function can be represented as numbers. If we apply larger number to alternatives, that automatically implies that this specific option is preferred over another one. But it also really important to say is that the numbers themselves, they have almost no meaning. They only help us to order choices within the choice set. Let's consider this example. If utility of 3 and utility of b is 1, this cannot be interpreted that a is 3 times better than b. It's basically, it indicates that utility of a is higher than utility of b. Also, another important aspect of uh, utility function is that if we have an infinite number of utility functions. Then we can allocate as many numbers as we want. Okay, let's consider other attributes of utility function. Third attribute is that utility does not have a dimension. Basically, it means that we cannot consider that as a specific currency or anything like, like that. Its uh, utility is just a subjective measure of satisfaction or pleasure that is uh, related to specific option, which indicates that something is better than something else or equally good or worse. Third attribute is that we cannot compare utilities between people. So for instance, if we use this ordering numbers, uh, even if uh, in it's uh, infinite value, then let's say if utility five uh, is for A, and that's the case for Andy, and then utility of the same option for Peter is 500, it doesn't mean that Peter likes A 100 times better than Andy. Uh, that's pretty important. Also, that's the first attribute of utility. We cannot summarize utilities. So for instance, let's consider Anna and uh, Let's consider Mary. And both of them, they are going to describe utility of option A. So let's say um, how much they prefer specific pair of shoes. They go to, together to a store and they analyze whether to buy one specific pair of shoes. Or let's say pair of shoes A. And then we allocate number to preference for A to Mary and preference of A to Anna. In both cases, adding those values, those utilities, doesn't say us anything because they are subjective and we cannot add 
subjective state to a subjective state. A summary of those doesn't make much sense. Let's consider another example. Uh, let's say that again in this example we have Anna. Let's say Anna decides how much time to spend at the gym. We can consider two utility functions. The first one, as you see here on the slide, assumes that Anna hates sports. If she hates sports, every minute at the gym causes her disutility, dissatisfaction. So in this case, if she hates sports, optimum time is just basically zero. The more time she spends, the lower is utility for her. On the other hand, we can consider another possibility. Let's say that Anna likes sports, but there is optimal time for her to be at the gym. In this case, uh, this graph it indicates optimal time. As you say, it's a normal distribution. Let's say in the first minute she doesn't like it so much, but then utility increases up to a specific optimum. And then if she spends too much time there, uh, it can lead to fatigue and also can be related to lower utility. Think yourself about a few examples of different utility functions. What that can be? Let's consider going uh, to a store, buying groceries, or um, let's say attending a wedding or going to a party. What would be utility function for all those activities? Another element of utility theory is related to uh, those specific assumptions that will be presented here. This assumption indicates that utility can be represented as a function that distributes in this format. It's a function of utility. Typically, we can say that if quantity of goods or services increases, that also increases utility. So it means that, yeah, if you earn a small amounts of money, utility maybe it's not higher, you do not get too much pleasure out of it. But the more money you get, the higher is utility. But at some point, Utility doesn't increase as much as before if the quantity of money you get also increases. That's important assumption of utility function. Thus, that can be described using this simple um, equation. So, it's a function that describes that utility is a multiplication of a constant and square root from quantity of goods or services. Let's see another example that helps to understand this function. The attributes of normal preferences, as you see here, is that all always you experience something then if that increases the better basically more is always better because in this case we use a smooth utility function we can also interpret the slope that the additional utility obtained by increasing the Q, so in this case uh, goods or values, uh, becomes smaller and smaller. This is a principle, uh, it's called diminishing marginal utility. As you will see later, it's a really important element of uh, prospect theory. So it's really important to remember 
thus diminishing marginal utility. Okay, let's see how that goes when we take into account this example. As you see here, we have an increase of goods or services. You can see that a triangle below this curve is like here. Of course, it's just a triangle, but what would be important is to see another triangle and compare this triangle or the surface under the curve to another triangle or to another surface um, under curve. As you see here, this increase can be described as a sigma 1, that's the first increase, and then the second increase here, it's a sigma 2. In the first place, sigma 1, it's basically a high increase, and in the second sigma 2, it's a smaller increase. And again, this normal preference, this smooth line, can describe multiple aspects in our lives. So that can be related, for instance, to making more money or to buying new, bigger and bigger house. In this case, that describes that at some point, increase in utility is not as high as before. This is how it goes.